Hello, I'm Mike Bird. I'm the lecturer and academic dean in theology at Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm going to read the opening chapter of my, my new book, Seven Things About the Bible I Wish All Christians Knew. This is a book I've written to help Christians get the most out of their Bible, to help them interpret it more wisely and more responsibly, you might say, to be able to understand some of the complexities or some of the hard things the Bible sometimes throws up at us and it strengthens our, our faith in the God who reveals himself in Scripture and help us to understand, you know, what, what Scripture is for. You know, it's, it's not merely a book of religion or dogma or decrees. It's a book that testifies that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It's, it's a book that points in its own way to Jesus Christ. And I want people to know about this book, know where it came from, how it was put together, how best to handle it, how it witnesses to Christ, and how it's okay to struggle to wrestle with some of the things it throws up for us when things don't seem quite right. And I want people to really, uh, really appreciate the Bible more and enjoy it. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a reading of the first chapter, chapter one, well, which well, the introduction before chapter one, I should say. So here we go. The Bible is a big book, but it is a cracking good read. It's a mixture of history, literature, and theology. It contains a diverse array of genres, including ancient Near Eastern creation stories, Bronze Age law codes, historical narratives, Hebrew poetry, wisdom literature, prophecy, Greco-Roman biography, ancient Greek historiography, letters, and an apocalypse. The, pipe, the Bible is not just a book. It is a library of books, many books describing the origins of the Hebrew people, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and the spread of the Christian church. Yet its central character is God, the God who creates, who legislates, who rescues rebels, who becomes human, who makes all things new. And there I can give a bit of a tip of the hat to Don Carson, his great book on that topic. What is more, there is no book that has influenced the politics, history, art, literature, music, and culture of Western civilization as much as the Bible. I submit, I submit to you that unless you have a sound grasp of the Bible, you cannot understand Shakespeare, the art of Michelangelo, American history, the music of Bach and Beethoven, the musical Hamilton, or even TV sitcoms like The Simpsons. The Bible is echoed in various facets of our culture, whether that is literature, music, entertainment, or politics. The Bible is felt everywhere, even if rarely respected. Yet the Bible is also a controversial book. Recently in Australia, a group calling itself Fairness in Religion in Schools has petitioned a state government to ban all scripture classes and religious education in schools. Uh, even though the classes are voluntary and uh, because the group regards the Bible as a deplorable book. The Bible is deemed contraband by communist and Islamic governments throughout the world. Evidently, there are many people who do not want the message of the Bible to be known and shared. In some places, the Bible is subversive literature with a powerful threat to the status quo. If you ask me, this is even more reason why we should read it. Of course, it's one thing to read the Bible. It is quite another thing to understand it, and another thing still to use it responsibly. To be honest, the Bible is very hard to understand in places, not because it's a book of mystery, magic, or mayhem, rather because it contains a history distant from our own. It was originally written to ancient audiences in particular context, and it was written for us, but not to us. If we are to grasp the Bible, what it means to its original audience and what it means for us today, then we must traverse some historical chasms and learn to interpret ancient cultures as much as our own culture. Understanding the Bible is rewarding, but it entails work, hard work. Well, the good news is that in this book, I intend to do some of that hard work for you. 
and get you ready to understand the Bible as God's word for you and your church. Along the way, we will avoid stereotypes, trite answers to tough questions, and superficial accounts of interpretive problems. Instead, I want to help you get your hands dirty in the biblical world. Immerse your minds in the strange and unfamiliar world of biblical history and introduce you to the big issues that the Bible throws up for those of us who would strive to understand it. Now, out of these seven things that we have, or the seven things I'm going to cover, the first thing, thing number one, the first thing I want to explore is the origin of the Bible. Now, maybe your preferred Bible is an app on your phone, a website, Bible software, or a good old-fashioned leather-bound book with all sorts of aids for the reader. Irrespective of how you access the Bible, the Bible you read came from a long process of composition, copying, canonization, and translation over some three millennia. The Bible has its own biography, its own story, we might say, about how it grew and came to be. And here I will, be your, I will give you a brief introduction on how the Bible went from ancient religion, religious scrolls to the printed book you hold in your hands. Spoiler alert, the Bible was not invented by the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. Okay, thing number two, the second thing is that we will need to wrestle with the two big I words, namely inspiration and inerrancy. Hold your hats for that one. It's a bumpy ride in theological jargon. Inspiration is where we explain how the Bible is both a God-given book and a human written book. How is it God's word in human language? Uh, how God imparts, infuses, or inspires his word into human authors. By exploring biblical inspiration, we are searching for an account of the Bible's divine origins and the human process of composition. So biblical inspiration is on the to-do list. Then there is inerrancy or infallibility, a hotly debated domain of discussion. If we believe the Bible is true, then how is it true? And to what extent is it true? Can the Bible have any errors of history, cosmology, or geology? Is the Bible only faultless in matters of religion and ethics? Now, some folks will just roll their eyes at inerrancy, as fundamentalist nonsense, and others will tell you that inerrancy is the center of their theological universe. But I tell you that we need to affirm the Bible's truthfulness and explain the nature and limits of its truthfulness. For the third thing, thing number three, it would be remiss of me if we did not tackle the topic of biblical authority. Assuming that the Bible is God's inspired word and is true, subjects worthy, worthy of their own explanation, exactly how does God's word work in our ordinary lives? Are we free to pick and choose the bits we like as if we were at some kind of buffet? Or are we to slavishly follow every precept it contains, even some of the strange stuff in the Old Testament? Or does adhering to the Bible, treating it as an authority, require a mixture of affirmation, obeying its instructions, and thoughtful appropriation, figuring out how to implement its wisdom in a world far away from its author and initial audience. Not everyone thinks the Bible is an authority, but for those of us who do, we still have to figure out how that authority works out in practice. And let me tell you, it's not straightforward. Moving from Canaan to Chicago is not easy. That brings us to the fourth thing, thing number four. Uh, the fourth thing is that it's important for Christians to grasp the back then-ness of the Bible. Yes, God's word is in many ways enduring and timeless. It speaks to people across the ages. It transcends cultures, languages, and nationalities. That's because God addresses people, all people, with the message of love in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we must remember that before the Bible was God's word to us, it was God's word to others. It was God's word to the Hebrews in Canaan. It was God's word to the Judean exiles in Babylon, God's word to the Christians in the slums and tenements of Rome, or to the persecuted churches of Asia Minor. We are tempted to think that the Bible is 
for us and therefore about us, about our time, and it finds its fulfillment in our circumstances. I mean, that's a type of hermeneutical narcissism. Because we have to remember that while the Bible is always relevant to us, if we are to really understand the Bible, then we must respect the original historical setting in which the books of the Bible were written. So knowing a bit of historical background, whether that's for the book of Jeremiah or Paul's letter to the Philippians, I mean, that will give us some of the best clues for how to interpret it in the present. So we must learn the importance of historical background. That brings us to thing number five. Okay, The fifth thing I wish to provide readers with is a basic introduction to interpreting the Bible. If you ask me, the big issue is not whether one takes the Bible literally or symbolically, but whether one chooses to take the Bible seriously. If we are indeed serious about the Bible, if we aspire to become someone who correctly handles the word of truth, to use the language of Paul in 2 Timothy, then we need to learn how to read it and teach from it responsibly. All Christians need a rudimentary introduction to the basics of hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is a fancy word for the science of interpretation. So have your thinking caps on for how to read the Bible without turning into a crackpot with your, your own cult charts and golf cart. The sixth thing we need to cover, the sixth thing to understand is that the key purpose of scripture is knowing God, deepening our faith, increasing in love for God and love for others, and resting in the hope that God is for us in Jesus Christ. The Bible equips us to know God better. It fosters faith in God and his son. It builds our capacity for love and it comforts us with the hope that is ours in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible can have all sorts of you know, functions, uses and applications and blessings, but chief among them are knowledge, faith, love and hope. If you get that, then I think you get the Bible. And finally, the seventh thing, the seventh and final thing is the relationship of Jesus Christ to the Bible. Now, this is easier to do, obviously, in the New Testament. It's a little bit harder to do in the Old Testament. You see, Christ is the center of our faith and the center to which the Bible itself testifies. Unsurprisingly, then, we will spend some time talking about how to read the Bible, including the Old Testament as if Jesus is its centerpiece and goal. Uh, what will be clear, I hope, is that the Holy Bible is a Jesus magnifying book. Well, that is basically the introduction to seven things about the Bible I wish all Christians knew. knew. Uh, that is what lies ahead of us. Hopefully by the end of it, um, my, my hope, my intention, my aspiration is that from this book, you will have a more profound grasp of what, who, how, and why of the Bible. So I hope you benefit from this book. Uh, I hope you get something out of it and certainly any um, churches or, or study groups or communities that are a part of it too. So that's what we're about. That's what we're doing. That is the road ahead in the book, Seven Things About the Bible I Wish All Christians Knew. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to post it in the uh, launch page uh, if you've joined up, and I'll see what you come up with. So the Lord bless you and keep you, and I hope you enjoy the journey to come.